Hello, I am 24 years old, and in the fall, I will be going into my seventh year of university and starting on my third major. First two uncompleted majors. I feel like for the past six years, I've really had the mindset of a 17 year old who's choosing what to do in university, which was mostly like, what am I interested in studying? So the first thing I chose was sociology and I was really interested in studying that. What's a sociologist though? What job do you get as a sociologist? Like HR? So then I transferred into social work after doing like, three quarters of a sociology degree and I've been doing social work for the past few years and I realized like I don't have the capabilities to be a social worker no matter how much school I do why am I in school to be a social worker I had a crisis and I switched my major to English and I'm just gonna work as a copy editor it does mean going back to school for longer even longer I'm going to have ended up spending nine years in university oh my god I'm kind of just like becoming a forever student. And at what point do you become a mature student? Because I feel like I'm still young, but I'm about to go into first year English classes with first years. Like I'm gonna be old. Anyway, I've been doing sociology and social work for a really long time. I haven't really done any English in a long time. I've never done any university level English. The last English class I took was literally in 12th grade, which was seven years ago. It's been a hot minute and I feel like I am not up to date on the classics. I have not read really any classics. I think the two books that I had to read in high school were like 1984 and The Outsiders. Other than Toni Morrison, that's all I've read in terms of classics. So I feel like I have to like in the next month before school starts, start to read some of these books that maybe I should have already read by now. So I have a stack of them. I don't think I'm gonna read all of these books because some of them seem really dull to me and I just like am not interested in doing that. And I guess that's kind of what classics are in a way is just dull books that you're not interested in reading but you do it for some other purpose. Mine is to feel more like I'm ready to be an English major. I'm trying not to like fully reinvent myself as an English major because I'm in the I'm in the feeling where I'm like, I gotta get a whole new wardrobe. I have to like embody an English major. I made a playlist. It has like Bob Dylan songs on it. Like, am I really gonna be that kind of person? That sounds insufferable, but like in my mind, I'm like, I need to get out of the social work headspace and become an English major. And part of that is reading some boring classics that I don't really care about. I've tried to pick out ones that I will like. Other than The Castle, I own The Castle by Franz Kafka, and I don't know why, because it doesn't seem like a book that I'd like. I mean, it's like, okay, first of all, this is like the filthiest copy of a book I've ever owned. It's disgusting. It has this like dried glue on it that is, I don't know, like I know it's just dried glue, but I find it so revolting for some reason. I just don't really want to read a book that's in typewriter font. So I'm not even sure why I've brought this into the stack, because I'm I'm writing it off right now. Other than that, I have Crime and Punishment, which does seem at least mildly interesting. It's long though. I guess I don't really know what an English major entails. Like, am I even gonna be reading books? Maybe I should have done like a modicum of research into the thing that I'm about to force myself to do for the next two and a half years before I like fully committed to it. What I'm saying is that this might actually mean nothing. This might be useless. Maybe I'm just gonna be writing essays and I'm not gonna have to read classic books. But you'd think you would have to, right? It's not a literature degree. So like, maybe not. Maybe this is meaningless. I also have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I think I have read this, like many, many, I think I read this when I was way too young to read this and I did not get it, but I don't remember anything from it. So I might be thinking of something else. Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. I've never read anything from James Baldwin and I am excited to finish this. I'm about halfway through it right now. I've already started it. This de definitely feels like something that you need to read before you start an English major. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I also think I've read this, but like as a child, like I think I read a child version of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I know I've read the child version of um, the whale book, Moby Dick. It's like just dumbed down for children and I think it maybe had pictures in it but it was also still very long so I feel like I've read Moby Dick even though it was definitely tailored towards 10 year olds. I think I've had the same thing with Frankenstein but I do want to actually read Frankenstein whereas I don't care to read Moby Dick again. I have The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. I have read Beloved and Sula and I loved them both and I know I'm gonna like this like absolutely. I might save this for last to like have something to look forward to. And then for some reason, <laughs> for some fucking reason, I picked out Fahrenheit 451 from the library. I don't want to read this. This is truly like a high school English class book. So maybe I won't read that one. So like, oh, my door was open. Oh, crazy. Give a meow. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on, please.
Will you please? <laughs> the cat literally never wants to hang out in my room unless I'm filming. I, I have no idea how he knows I'm doing it, but he always wants to be sitting behind me on the bed cleaning himself while I film. So I'm like 80 or 90 pages into Giovanni's room. I've been reading it all day, and it is a really good... I don't know why he needed to tell us he was doing that. It is really good so far, but it also is definitely a product of its time. There are some opinions about gender that are quite violent and uncomfortable to read. I got like two pages into this and it was talking about the guillotine and I was like, the guillotine? I thought this was set in the 1950s. What, like, is this 1832? As it turns out, I'm actually just like super ignorant about history and the guillotine was definitely still being used in the 50s. I don't know, like the French are fucked up. <laughs> like, maybe I should have expected that. So far, this is chronicling the life of an American who moves to Paris and meets a man there, and they kind of fall in love, but he also is really caught up in this sense of shame, and he doesn't really understand his own morality. It's really about him wrestling with his sense of self and his own identity. The dialogue is great. There's this, like, kind of sense of humor throughout, even though it is quite dark and can be upsetting. And I think he makes use of French phrases in a really good way where, like, I'm Canadian, but I don't understand French. And, like, I don't understand French at all, but I don't need to, like, continuously be translating things and looking things up to get what's going on. I think that if you did understand French, the French that's being used is still meaningful, but it's not so meaningful as to make it inaccessible for people who don't speak French, which I, is really skilled to be able to do that, I think. So I think I'm gonna spend the rest of the day reading this, and then after that I'll start Crime and Punishment just to kind of get it over with, and I'll check in with you when I'm finished this. Hello, hello. It is the next day. I've finished Giovanni's room and I've started Crime and Punishment. I thought Giovanni's room was really good. It was super exploratory and observant, both of the specific time and place that it's set in, Paris in the 1950s, and also of like very universal human experiences and thoughts that could have been written from the perspective of someone a hundred years before this book was set or a hundred years after. The main character, David, is super closed off and he's just a total mess when it comes to relationships. He can't figure out how to love someone else without holding parts of himself back. David is grappling with so much trying to figure out his own identity but also being really afraid of it, but he also knows through all this struggle that he's not going to end up happy. He's not going to make the choices that will lead him to live a happy life, and he doesn't. And he just kind of does things knowing what the end is going to look like, and he makes pretty selfish choices knowing that they won't end well for either party involved, but still doing them anyway, I think because often he thinks it's what he's supposed to do. And then other times he just can't move away from his own desire, even though he doesn't think he's supposed to be doing the things that he desires. What was really strong about this is that it feels like an entire complete story. Like, you're left obviously not knowing the rest of David's life, but you do kind of know how it's going to play out for him. And the end kind of loops back to where it starts at the beginning, so it feels like you have a strong sense of closure once the book is finished. And the prose is beautiful. I'm really excited that James Baldwin is such a prolific author because this is the first thing I've ever read by him, and I'm very excited to keep reading more of his work. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, I fucking hate this so far. I'm torturing myself reading this. I'm doing my best to just like push through it, push through it, because I've heard good things about this book from people whose tastes I trust, but this is such a classic. I should not have started with Giovanni's Room, which was written in the 1950s. This was written a hundred years before that, and oh my god, does it feel like it is. It is so fucking Russian. I'm only 60 pages in, so please keep in mind that all of these things I'm about to say are being said by someone who has read very little of this large book. So far, there are dozens of characters, and I don't know who any of them are other than, like, the main five. There's so many people, and they all have these, like, 15-letter long, very Russian names. And it is impossible for me to tell who is important, who I'm supposed to know, like, who has been mentioned before and I've just forgotten their name, and who's being mentioned for the first time, because there's not often, like, explanations of who these people are. I feel like this drone's on and on and on. Like, it's like, okay, here's this huge, long, boring monologue. Okay, here's another huge, long, boring monologue. Here's a fucking 10-page letter from his mother. Here's a guy in a bar going off about things that maybe are important. Maybe I'm supposed to know them. He's, he's talking about 25 new characters that 
do they mean anything? I want it to be good, but I just like am struggling to get through this. It's taking me two minutes per page, which is double the amount of time it usually takes me. Like this feels like such a fucking slog. What I have heard about this book is that it's about a guy who kills two people, which it says on the back cover. So like, that's not a spoiler at all. And then it, it basically the rest of the book is about him being super paranoid about it. And that sounds really interesting to me. None of that has happened yet. He's I, like thinking about killing. I think he's about, I think, I think he's about to kill these two people. So like, maybe it'll pick up from there. Like honestly, 60 pages for nothing to happen in 60 pages is fine for a 500 page book. It just is so slow to read that it feels like I've been reading for 200 pages and nothing has happened. So I'm really going to have to fight myself to get through this. Um, I can already feel that this is not going to be a fun experience for me and that I don't like books that are written in 1866, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to read 150 pages of this every day and that way I can finish it in three days and then be fucking done with it. And I kind of made a mistake yesterday because I was just not feeling good yesterday. I'd messed up my medication and I was like so foggy there was no way I was going to be able to read any of this so instead I started reading Milk Fed by Melissa Broder and I I love it because I know it's going to be easy to read because I've read Death Valley and I love Death Valley and like the way she writes is very very easy to read and it was and I like devoured like almost a hundred pages of it in one sitting and I just want to keep reading that so badly but I told myself I was going to read Crime and Punishment if I put this down and pick something else up I'm never going to pick it up again because, like, this is genuinely some CIA torture technique. Like, this is, reading this for me is against the Geneva Convention. I am hating it so much. I'm being so dramatic. I, like, I just, like, there's nothing good about it so far. I feel like I've been reading this all day and I'm only 60 pages in. That's crazy. But I'm gonna keep pushing through because I... What's the reason, actually? Like, why am I doing this to myself? I feel like... I should be someone who has read at least some of the classics before I start an English major. I don't feel like I'm someone who needs to research an English major before I start it, but I do feel like I should have read Crime and Punishment. Ugh. The rumors you've heard are true. I have finished Crime and Punishment. I really don't want to be that guy who's like, Actually, this highly regarded classic work of fiction that millions of people have thought of as very, very well written and a good story is not that great. It is good. It just didn't work for me at all. I think just like as someone who does not really read classics, this was not good for my introduction into it because it's very old. It's very Russian and the pacing is not awesome. The first 70 pages, in my opinion, are unreadable nonsense. I hated them and I was like, how am I going to get through this book? Like, I don't know what is happening. I don't want to keep reading this. Like, every ounce of my being was like, get the fuck away from this book. <laughs> it's so dramatic. But like, it's genuinely true. I don't know how I got through those first 70 pages. And then the plot picks up and it gets a lot faster paced and it's so much better for like 70 pages and then it goes back down to how it was in the beginning and it just keeps going like that up and down and up and down like a fucking EKG but not my EKG because this book actually was almost the death of me. I spent I think 20 hours reading this over three days. It was all I did for the past three days. I'm so happy to not be reading Crime and Punishment anymore. <laughs> there are definitely some things that this book does really well and of course there are. It is so highly regarded. Like the characters are incredibly vivid and vibrant and dramatic and insane and it's super atmospheric. I think it was really insightful into different ideologies and theories of the nature of crime and I thought that the main character's perspective was really interesting often, but it sometimes bordered on being so theoretical and it was like academic almost that it became very boring to read these like long monologues about what each character thought about things. There are so many, I think I already said this, there are so many characters in this book. I ended up having to keep a list at the end to remind myself who was who because there are so many characters and they each have three names, which just made it really hard to follow for me. But once I started keeping the list, I think it made it a lot easier for me to understand what was going on. And that wasn't really my main problem with it. My main problem with it was the pacing was fucking awful. There were like so many fucking monologues. I was so bored. This m maybe in some ways has turned me away from classical literature, at the very least, like Russian literature set in the 1800s and written in the 1800s. 
I don't think that's for me. And I know, honestly, that is a lot of classic literature. Like, I'm ruling out a lot of classic literature with that, but this has really turned me off of it. <laughs> but what this did do was teach me a lot of discipline for reading things that I am not interested in and I am forcing myself to read, which I think is really good for an English major. And I did do some research into an English major, and you do have to read classics. So I, I think I benefited a lot from reading this. I'm just... Honestly, right now, I finished it like half an hour ago and I'm so thrilled to be done with it. I'm so excited to put this back on my bookshelf and never touch it again or think about it again because I have been thinking about it for three fucking days. And I'm also more than anything excited to read Milk Fed. I'm about to tell you that the next book I'm gonna read is The Bell Jar, but really I'm gonna read Milk Fed and I'm gonna devour it. I'm gonna spend the rest of the night reading it. I'm gonna read the whole thing tonight. Then I'm gonna read The Bell Jar. And that I think is gonna be better than this was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dostoevsky. I'm so sorry to everyone who's read this and liked it. There are so many five-star reviews of this on Goodreads. It's crazy. Like I truly feel like nobody wants to be the person who's like, this didn't work for me, but I'll be brave. I'll be the knight in shining armor here. This did not work for me. I'm covering up the camera because I got a really bad haircut and I need to warn you before I show my face because it's going to be really jarring. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. This is not what I asked for at all. Like, at all. I don't think there's anything redeemable about this haircut. I can't make it look good no matter what I do. It just is not a good haircut. I feel like I told the hairdresser, what I really hate most about my hair is that it sticks up back here. Like, right in this spot, it sticks up so much. And she heard that as, emphasize it. <sighs> so I'm not going to subject you to that. I'm going to wear a hat. It even looks bad with the hat. Do I look bald? I look bald, don't I? I really wanted to finish this video before I got the haircut because I knew this was gonna be a problem. I always look bad when I get my haircut. This is beyond, this is, this is just beyond. But I think it's kind of crazy to have a haircut in the middle of a video but I didn't finish it. I had this like weird experience where I got like addicted to YouTube shorts, even though they're not good. There is no good content posted on YouTube shorts. I don't like anything that I see on there. It is so depressing to go into your watch history and see shorts 54 watched. Before that, I did finish The Bell Jar. This, I hate this edition. Can I just start with that? This is the ugliest cover that I've ever seen of this book. And also it's absolutely falling apart. I, I like to really bend the book. I want it to be flat like that. I just think it's more comfortable to read if you can read it like this. I hate hardcovers for that reason. This book would not let me do that. It is bound so poorly that the pages are legitimately just falling out. So that was annoying. This is about a young woman named Esther Greenwood, who is a university student who's been selected. At the beginning, she's living in this hotel in New York, working for a fashion magazine, along with a bunch of other young writers her age. And she's very disconnected from what's going on, and she's super ungrateful, but in that kind of depressed way where you know that you would have loved what's happening to you, but you just can't bring yourself to appreciate it in the moment. And so she just kind of lives through these days in a haze, these days that should have been really impactful in her life and really important to her. She just can't really feel. And then that ends. I, I kind of thought the whole book was going to be about that. I knew she went to a mental hospital and I went into this book really expecting it to be about the mental hospital, but that doesn't happen until quite a bit later in the book. She finishes her like internship or whatever at the New York magazine and goes back to her hometown in Boston. And there she just really, really sinks into her depression. And she tries to kill herself so many times it's almost comical. Like if you, th if you really think about it, it is a little bit funny how many times she failed at killing herself. Then she gets sent to an asylum and she's institutionalized. And that is like kind of an interesting look at the way women you know, privileged white women were treated. There's really no autonomy. There's no autonomy and there's no expectation of autonomy, which I found really interesting. I think at this point, it's kind of a tired complaint about this book that it is really racist. I see people talking a lot about how like, obviously Sylvia Plath is a product of her time. I do think that like, there were lots of people in the 1960s who were not racist. And so it's not that she necessarily had to be, but we also can't really judge her by today's standards. And it's not even just racist. There, there's no group of people that she doesn't hit on in this book. She, there's a drive-by for literally everybody, and it's all so needless. Like, it's just these random little comments about every marginalized group that has ever existed, basically. Like, she will get you. She will get you. She will say some weird offhand remark 
that is super discriminatory about whoever you are. And so I think in a way we're all really included in this book because what the fuck? Anyone who calls this like a feminist masterpiece is actually sick in the head. This is really just a uh, insightful look at a very overrepresented perspective of like a mentally ill white woman. I guess at the time of 1963 or whenever this came out, the mentally ill perspective was not as oversaturated in media as it is right now. So, you know, viewing it from that perspective, this is sort of unique, but like really from today's world of media, and literature. This is not anything special. But I did, I think, like this more than I was expecting to. I found it to be incredibly readable, especially following Crime and Punishment, which was not readable for me at all. The way the main character is feeling is incredibly relatable, and so it does show you that depression exists and manifests in very similar ways, obviously differently for everyone, but like throughout a long period of time, she lives in a very different era than we do now and still is feeling the same things. The way she acts is not relatable at all. She is so mean and so irritating and rude to everyone around her and she never reflects on it and she does not care what anyone thinks about how like bitter and rude she constantly is. And I found that annoying. I didn't really find her to be a sympathetic character because she just like is not nice ever. Like she just is so angry at the world honestly for no reason like she's a very privileged character and it's just like irritating one thing about this that actually i was really disappointed by this is like a complete tangent and has nothing to do with the book but i saw a review saying this book was homophobic when i was like 30 pages from the end and i thought i really thought that there was not going to be any homophobia and that the person reviewing it would have was talking about the use of the word queer which obviously meant something different at the time and it wasn't and that was really the biggest upset here other than like the extreme racism that was just so out of the blue and so constant the biggest upset was that that one random reviewer that i saw online was not talking about the use of the word queer <laughs> as to why this is homophobic wouldn't that have been funny wouldn't that have been so funny i love that i'm gonna start doing that i think i'm gonna start doing that anyway that was the bell jar it's fine. I finished that and then I got this far through Frankenstein. I'm hoping to finish this tonight. I might not. I'm loving this. I am- I get it. Like, I get why Frankenstein is this huge thing that it is. This is fantastically written. Mary Shelley is so fucking talented. I think we all knew that. I think I'm really far behind on this. I know I'm not saying anything novel. She is- such a fucking good writer. I feel like I'm marking up almost every page of this book. I'm gonna have so many quotes to write down when I'm finished with this because her use of language is so fucking beautiful. This is uh, amazing. I think that the pacing can be a little bit slow and I just think that that's part of 1800s literature. And for, for, for the other 1800s literature that I've read, this is paced a lot better. And comparing it to that, this is pretty fast paced. Comparing it to modern literature, this is pretty slow in the middle, but I'm still really interested in the story. Something else I really have to say about this is that this is absolutely a gay allegory and there's no other way to read it. It's about homosexuality. Everything about it is so gay. It's like straightforwardly gay, but it's also metaphorically gay. And I love that for her and I love that for this book. Yeah, it's just really good. This might be my favorite book that I've read so far in this video. I realized when I started this, I was like, everybody knows Frankenstein. I did not know Frankenstein. I didn't know what happened in Frankenstein. Like, really think, if you haven't read this book, really think to yourself, what happens in Frankenstein? He makes a monster who comes to life. Then what? I had no idea. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm, like, extremely specifically ignorant of Frankenstein. But, like, this is all a surprise to me, and I'm very excited by that. I'm gonna go finish this, and then after that, I'm gonna read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, and that's gonna be my last book. I'm not reading Fahrenheit 451. Why did I pick that up? I've actually only heard bad things about that. There is not one person who I've ever heard talk about that and say anything positive. I might read it because I'm I'm kind of curious why everybody hates it so much. I'm not gonna read it. I'm not gonna read it in this video. Maybe one day I'll read it. I think I'm gonna do this again before school starts, but for now, it's just these two books. I know I'm gonna enjoy Toni Morrison and I'm loving this, so I'm, I'm excited.
All right, I'm here for an update. I finished Frankenstein. It was so fucking good. Five stars, absolutely, through and through. I totally understand why this is a classic, why it has been adapted so many times. I, th I just loved it. Obviously, it was written in the early 1800s, so the language is like a little bit archaic, but I do think that it's very readable, and compared to other work from the 1800s, it's pretty quickly paced. It can be a little slow sometimes, but the structure is so interesting that even the slow parts I wanted to read so badly. This is structured as a series of letters, so it's a bunch of first-person accounts, so you really get in the heads of the characters and you learn a lot about their worldview and how they approach things in front of them because they're telling their own stories. It starts as letters from a ship captain to his sister, and it really just gives you the exposition of who it is that's writing the story. The ship captain encounters Victor Frankenstein, who then tells him his story, so it's the captain transcribing Frankenstein's story, and then at one point it shifts to the, the monster who's telling Frankenstein his story and Frankenstein is telling the captain the monster story. It's a little bit convoluted, but it makes sense when you're reading it. It's just kind of hard to explain, but it's perfect for this story. You just get to know so much about everyone. And the beginning really gives you a lot of insight into the love that these characters have in their lives, which contrasts greatly against the complete lack of love and connection that the monster experiences. And that's what this is really about. Like, it's hugely about loneliness and monstrosity and, you know, like I said, homosexuality. The monster is seen as unnatural and unlovable, and because of this, he's shunned by society and abandoned by his creator, and there's this violence inflicted upon him because of things that other people can see about him that he can't in the beginning necessarily understand about himself. It's the clearest allegory I've ever seen in my life. I don't know if it was Mary Shelley's intention. I kind of think it was, but even if it wasn't, it's difficult to read it in any other way. It's just like so fucking straightforward to me. This is about being gay and being ostracized for it. And the monster is obviously so complex. I think even people who haven't read this, anyone who's familiar with Frankenstein understands him to be a sympathetic character. And he really is, but he also is a monster because he is committing these unforgivable acts so that he can get his way. But the core of what he wants is so human and so relatable that it's hard not to see him in some sort of like you know, sympathetic light. I refuse to believe that this was written by a 19 year old. It's incredible. Everything it does, it does perfectly. It's good throughout. Like there's really no lulls and there's no parts that could have been better. It's just like a fantastic piece of literature. And I can't recommend it enough. This is one of my favorite books that I've ever read in my entire life. It's so fucking good. I truly only have praise for this. I loved it. And so much more than I was expecting to like it. Like, it was crazy. Okay, I've also made it about 60 pages from the end of The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, and this is absolutely fantastic. I am kind of struggling to pick it up right now, though, and that has nothing to do with the book. That is because I am so burnt out on classics. I want to read something way more plot-heavy than the four books, five books that I've recently read. And so it is hard for me to really get into this, but I also am not someone who can read two books at once. So this is the only thing I'm reading. I just want to be reading something that's like way faster paced than this. That's not a pro like, this isn't like so, so slow paced as to be boring. If I was reading this at any other time, I know I'd rip through it and I know that I would love it. It's just right now, it's been a lot of classics. Too many, too many classics. So it's like a little bit hard for me to want to read this. As soon as I start though, I mean, it's amazing. It's Toni Morrison. It wasn't ever going to be anything other than amazing. This is her first novel. Oh my God. It doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Like I, I actually don't get how she is so good at what she does. It's fucking crazy. The Bluest Eye is about a young black girl growing up in the 1940s in, I think, Ohio. I think like all of the books I've read from Toni Morrison have been set in Ohio so far. I assume that's where she's from. That'd be crazy if it wasn't, though. Like, imagine imagine she'd never been to Ohio. This is hugely about being a Black woman in America, and it's really, really focused on beauty standards and the effect that they have on Black women and the violence that they inflict upon Black women. And the young girl who this story is about has accepted that she and the rest of her family is just ugly, and it really impacts her day-to-day -day life, obviously. And I think that this quote really sums up what I mean when I say that it's about beauty standards. It was as though some mysterious, all-knowing master had given each one a cloak of ugliness to wear, and they had each accepted it without question. The master had said, you are ugly people. They had looked about themselves and saw nothing to contradict the statement. Saw, in fact, support for it, leaning at them from every billboard, every movie, every glance. Yes, they had said, 
you are right. Yeah, so a lot of it is about how the outside world really reinforces this idea that she has that she's ugly because she doesn't live up to the standards of whiteness that have been set as the goal of beauty. But it also really is just about her and it's about the people in her life and it gives this like really rich context to people surrounding her. Like it will tell these really in-depth stories about people that she encounters and people that are related to her that don't necessarily have anything to do with her but give so much context to the world that she's living in. It's so fascinating. It's such a character study on so many levels. Like you really get so much information about her through the people around her. And I am really excited to finish this. I think I'm gonna finish it tonight. I have to finish it tonight. We are leaving for camping tomorrow and I need to be done with the classics before I go out camping because this I think just needs all of my attention right now and I, I want to read things while I'm camping that don't need all of my attention. Like I, I just need to read some fluff basically. Some like thriller, you know, like something kind of corny and cheesy where this is not corny at all. This is maybe the least corny book that has ever existed. So I'm finishing it tonight. I hope I will check in with you once I'm done later. I'm sure it will be really orange in here. Hey, so I did not record my update for The Bluest Eye after I finished it. It's like a week later. I went camping. I I've taken some time to think about it, but also to forget everything that I thought about it. So I've had to like refresh myself a little bit on what I felt about this book. I mean... I loved it, of course. I loved it as a piece of fiction. It was not easy to read this book. This is a very disturbing and dark and upsetting book, and I definitely felt that while I was reading it. And I think with this book, it's not just the content that makes it so heavy, though the content is incredibly disturbing. It is also the fact that all of the choices that Toni Morrison makes while writing this are made to implicate the reader in both the story and the greater context that the story is set in. And it has every right to do that, but it is very demanding of you and it makes this what looks like this like small little innocuous book to be very heavy and hard to get through and feel a lot longer than it is it's not hard to get through in the way that it's like difficult to read the language her writing is so fantastic that it's so it is so easy to read like writing wise but content wise and what it asks of you it can be very difficult and uncomfortable, but it's so masterful. I loved reading her afterward at the end of this edition that I have because it told me so much about just the choices that she was making. Like she starts out with the narrator kind of letting you in on a secret, which makes you instantly like very intimate and familiar with the story. And so you can't really like separate yourself from it as easily, I guess. And the story is also told in parts. And so it makes the reader assemble it on their own, which again, like forces you to be a part of the story and forces you to think about how you're a part of the story. It's just done so well. One thing about the afterward is that she's so fucking hard on herself. This is her first novel. So I think like probably anybody would be hard on themselves. But after reading this like fantastic, impeccable piece of work, it's kind of crazy to go to the end and see all the things that she herself didn't feel were that strong. Obviously, at the time of writing the afterward, she's had such a long and like monumental career. Like she had won the Nobel Prize in literature. So like she's gonna look at it with a critical eye. I just, I could not really see all of the things that she didn't like about it. I just thought that was like, I don't know, it was kind of interesting. I think yet another way that she makes this to be a very difficult read is because she humanizes the characters that victimize this young girl. Th this girl is victimized by everyone. She's victimized by the world she lives in and by every single character in the story, essentially. And the people that are really easy to write off as monsters, she gives a lot of context to who they are and how they came to be that way. And like, in some ways, you are able to empathize with them. And that is like, really interrogative. You really have to think about where you stand on a lot of things when you're reading this book and what you have done to reinforce like beauty standards and ideas about desire and sexuality that are present in this. It absolutely blows my mind that in her first novel, she is able to ask so much of the reader. This is so good so, so, so heavy. So that's it, really. That's what I plan to do for this video. I'm happy to be finished with this, and I think I am going to do this again before school starts. I think that I, while not loving every book necessarily, this really did teach me a lot, and I do feel more prepared. I feel like I've diversified my, my reading. Like, my taste is very contemporary and this has opened my eyes to the fact that like actually there is some classic literature that i would like and that i do want to read i fucking loved frankenstein that's like one of my favorite books of all time and that showed me like i can get through language that i used to think was way too dense for me in order to read work that is like 
so fucking good. And I, I do think that I have a different sort of standard for classic literature. Like, I think I just think lowly of it for some reason. And so when it really like tells a great story, I love that shit. This also really taught me discipline, particularly crime and punishment. This was so fucking hard to read and I did it. And I read it in the three days that I was anticipating I would read it in. I was making myself do this. I'm gonna have to make myself read things that I don't wanna read. So I did, like, honestly, I learned a lot from Crime and Punishment, mainly in terms of how I approach reading things I don't want to. And I think I've also learned that one of the main draws for classics for me is that it feels a lot more meaningful and impactful for me to relate to people, like to characters that were written 200 years ago, than it does for me to relate to characters that are written in like the current situation that I live in. Because like, of course, I'm going to relate to that. So like the more universal aspects of the human experience are really shown in classics. And I love that about a lot of these. I think I'm going to rank them a little bit. I think I'm going to do a little bit of ranking. Okay, to finish this video off, I'm going to rank these five books by a couple of different metrics. The first being readability. And I think that the most readable was The Bell Jar. This was not my favorite, but its strongest suit was that it was readable. After that, The Bluest Eye, then Frankenstein, then Giovanni's Room. I found it a little bit dense. And then Crime and Punishment. But there's like a large gap between these four and this one for sure. My next ranking is the quality of the themes that it explores or how well it explores the, the themes that it sets out to. And that's definitely going to start with the bluest eye and then very close second of Frankenstein, then Giovanni's room, then Crime and Punishment, then The Bell Jar. The Bell Jar was shallow. I think I already said that. It was just kind of a shallow book. Okay, finally, I'm just going to rank them by my general overall enjoyment of the books. And this, like, I'm not really sure about because I think that while reading it, I did enjoy my experience of reading The Bell Jar more, but I think that Crime and Punishment will stick with me for longer. So I am placing it above The Bell Jar. This was forgettable, and I'm I'm never going to think about it again. I'm going to think about Frankenstein a lot, and I'm also going to think about The Bluest Eye a lot. Giovanni's Room, pretty good. I already kind of don't really remember, like, what happened in it, and I read it, like, two weeks ago. Then Crime and Punishment. And then, sorry to Sylvia Plath, The Bell Jar is maybe the least impactful book of these. Definitely the least impactful book of these. Okay, that's the video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.